I have a very good friend of mine, wonderful person, and uh, very, very well-known author, Robert Buval, joining me for this hour to discuss something that uh, I think we've all been seeing quite a bit in the headlines everywhere, the Vatican, the Pope change of power for the church. Everybody has been kind of watching that, or at least they've heard about it from the very least. Um, but we have Pope Francis, the Vatican, and its occult designs tonight. Under the Pope's nose, the architect, the astronomer, and the Vatican, who was behind the occult heretical design of St. Peter's Piazza on the Vatican. We're going to be talking about that tonight. International best-selling author and founder of the Orion Ferry, Robert Bavall, joins me from Spain to discuss his soon-to-be-released book called The Vatican Mystery, The Quest for the Hermetic City of the Sun, who co-authored with Chiara Dianelli. I hope I pronounced that correctly. He's giving his first interview in the United States right here on the Hillary Ramos Show, so you haven't heard any of this anywhere else. You don't want to miss this hour, so get comfortable and uh, settle in because it's going to be fascinating. So welcome, Robert. Thank you for returning. Hi, Hillary. <laughs> So, so we have this fabulous book that's coming out. Why don't you share what it's all about with everybody? Yes. Uh, first of all, let me just pronounce the name of my co-author. It's Chiara Dainelli. She is a Roman author. She lives in Rome. And uh, she has recently published a book on uh, Dante's Inferno which is, of course, very appropriate because Dan Brown is coming up with a, with a fictional book. Um, yeah, well, this book is uh, my opus, really. Uh, I, I, it's been an adventure writing it, and uh, I feel like I've been in some sort of detective story over the last year, uh, spanning over 200 years in the time of... Uh, Western history that is the most exciting, uh, the, the Renaissance, the Italian Renaissance, literally the rebirth of the Western world. And uh, the conclusion uh, and thesis of this book is, uh, is really mind-blowing. It, I know I'm going to use a, a kind of cliché, but it, it kind of makes Dan Brown's Angel and Demons look like a like a Sunday school uh, stroll in Central Park. I mean, this, this is the real thing <laughs> with, uh, with very exciting characters, although it's, it's, it's non-fiction and it's, uh, it's amazingly well... I, I'm blowing my trumpet, but it's really very well researched, mainly because I've had the help of uh, various people, and particularly, particularly a professor uh, at... Uh, the University of Rome, La Sapienza. It's, a, it's in fact the largest university in the world, odd enough. And uh, we got together over the last uh, five months, uh, he in Rome and, and me here. I've been to Rome many, many times, of course, because of this book, uh, digging very, very deeply into the archives and the letters and the documents to come up with this it is amazing conclusion. So that's what the book is about. And there are some very colorful characters. One of them, which I'll be talking about uh, somewhere along the line of this uh, interview, is a very odd person. I think you'll be very interested in this person, Hillary. Uh, she is Queen Christina of Sweden, who uh, plays a major role in the Renaissance, or rather the late Renaissance, uh, for uh, something that she did, which kind of stunned the whole of Europe. But anyway, let me let me get into the meat of this. Um, can I go on, or you have? Yes, please. Wanna... No, please. Well, I I think it's fascinating because I really don't know too much about the book. It it, it hasn't um, really been released yet, and nothing. So really, everything you you're willing to share with us, um, you know, we would love to hear it. Please continue. <laughs> Yeah, okay. First of all, let me tell you a, bit, a little bit more about the, uh, the uh, machinery of publication because the book is just being edited at the moment. It's rather unusual for us to give interviews that early, but uh, because you asked me and because I think it's, it's the right moment really to put people in the picture, not only of this book, but uh, what's going on at the Vatican. A very exciting moment in history for uh, for the Western world, really. Um, and uh, 
basically, um, what is going to happen in, in the next few months is that I'll be editing. I'm actually editing at the moment uh, the, the, the approach that I have and, I, uh, and my publishers have. By the way, they're inner traditions in, uh, in Vermont. They've been publishing all my uh, latest books recently. Very good publisher. I'm very pleased with them. Mm -hmm. And they, um, <clears throat> they've got now the, uh, the, the first draft. I'm going through an edit. They will be getting the, the, the edit in about uh, three, four weeks. Then we, I go through with them, and the book should be out sometime in November, I hope. So that's, that's what's going to happen. So we're rather Wonderful. early for... Well, it, is early, for it is early, but, you know, like you said, it's, you know, we have this, is, this is in everybody's mind and consciousness right now because it's so, it's, it's just everywhere. We've had this big shift of power. What do you, before we get into the book, what do you feel, uh, how do you feel about this uh, transition, about the Pope uh, resigning and then having Pope Francis come in uh, to take his place? You know, I, I was born a Catholic um, in a very Catholic family in Egypt. Uh, in the days where I was born, where you were still uh, somewhere in the ether, <laughs> I think, Hillary. I was, I was traveling through in, the stars, Robert. <laughs> yes, I, I was born in 1948, so that kind of sets the, the scene. And in those days, uh, particularly in the city of Alexandria, uh, Christianity was really a very big thing. It still is, surprisingly, you know, even though it's a Muslim country. And uh, so I grew up in this kind of very intense Catholic atmosphere. Uh, and when I left Egypt when I was uh, nearly 20, I was sent to England to finish my studies. And I was put, <laughs> of all places, to finish my higher education, my school education, at a Franciscan college where I was a boarder. So I lived for two years with those uh, Franciscan priests whom, by the way, I uh, have great, great admiration for them. But uh, I, I did revolt and rebel against uh, Catholicism, uh, not in an aggressive way, but basically uh, mainly because of my studies, you know, uh, especially when I started uh, studying comparative religion and uh, Egyptian religion. And uh, the bottom line is that what's going on at the moment is very, very interesting. Having looked from my, from my early days in Egypt to now, uh, many people are not really aware of the dramatic change. Uh, they've heard about it. Uh, first of all, the, the, the rather strange uh, resignation of uh, of uh, Pope Benedict in the 16th. I mean, this is, from an historical point of view, uh, it is really stunning. A Pope can indeed leave his office, uh, but he cannot be fired. It's one of those positions. He's there for life, and usually a Pope stays for life. They, 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 the change of Pope is when one Pope dies and the other one comes in. But uh, it happened before in history for different reasons, but this time... Even though the official uh, reason is that he was getting old and tired and felt he could not uh, uh, deal with the, uh, with the uh, intricate and heavy load of, of uh, the Catholic Church with all its problems, as we all know, uh, I think that the decision has a very strong political uh, aspect to it. And this is... Uh, apparent from the choice uh, made, uh, the voting that happened uh, a couple of weeks ago, for the new Pope, Pope Francis uh, I. Shall I go on a bit on this? What did you think, um, what did you think of the, his name choice? Well, it's an odd one because, uh, like I said, I was putting your, your listeners in the picture because, first of all, uh, one thing that is uh, very clear with this Pope is that he surprised everybody, uh, including the, uh, the Curia in Rome, including the cardinals, apparently, uh, with the choice. Uh, he is rather old. Uh, he is in 84, I think. And he uh, is not... Uh, sorry, I didn't give his age right. He's over 70. And he, uh, of all things, um, 
he is the very he's he's the first in many things by the way he's the first jesuit pope I'll, I'll talk about this in a minute he's the first pope from outside europe he's the first pope from from the americas he's definitely the first pope from south america and he's the first pope to choose the name francis so he's uh, got a lot of firsts to his name which <laughs> which attracts a lot of attention Mm. But I was, I was the first thing I reacted because I knew about him and I knew uh, well I was writing the book and as you will see or, or read when you get hold of a copy of this book is that and uh, frankly I, I had no idea of course that all this would happen but this book uh, that I've just finished the, the Vatican mystery uh, has an intense uh, aspect of it related to the Jesuit order. In, in the Renaissance, in fact, from the, the time that the Jesuit order was formed. And uh, I'm, I'm jumping the gun here a bit, but the Jesuit order at the time was formed principally to act, <coughs> excuse me, as a counter-reformation movement. What was going on at the time was that uh, the big surprise of the Christian world was that it split in two. Uh, totally unexpectedly because of, of course, Martin Luther who uh, comes to Rome in the bicentennial of the 15th, 16th century, uh, is totally disgusted with the opulence of the papacy and their squandering of money and their indulgences and all these things. And he goes back to Germany and he writes his famous uh, thesis and suddenly the Christian world is split into two with the Lutherans or Protestants and the Catholics on the other side, and hell breaks loose. Um, and the game, uh, apart from many wars that it produced, was to, on the one side, to convince the Catholics to become Protestants, and on the other side, to convince the Protestants to return to Catholicism. <laughs> and, yeah, it's still going on, by the way. <laughs> I don't think it ever stops. It's always a matter of somebody well, trying no, no, to convince I, I'm something to do this. I know, you, I know, I know, but it's... It just amuses me because it always feels like that's, it's always, you know, come to me kind of thing. Con, you know, convert, convert, be this, be that. It's silly. Well, uh, the reason I'm saying all this is because the Jesuit order is a converting machine. And that's the very reason why it was set. In fact, it, it, it uh, uh, let me give you a background. I mean, it was founded by a group of Basque Spaniards. The principal founder was Ignatius of Loyola. They were actually soldiers. Uh, they were in France at the time, and uh, they banded together a group of seven uh, men who became priests and proposed the founding of this order uh, to, the, to the Pope. And the Pope loved it because they said, well, we'll set up a college and we'll train uh, people under this Jesuit order to become converters. Literally, uh, the college, which at the time was called the Collegio Romano, was a propaganda college. It's, it still has, it's still called the propaganda college. And uh, the idea was that they were going to be trained to go about, send missionaries, some very famous missionaries, which uh, uh, some of your listeners would know. For example, St. Francis Javier, who went to evangelize India. Uh, very, very successfully, uh, a large part of the Indian continent uh, was converted to Catholicism and still is Catholic. And others, of course, went to South America and very, very successfully converted there. Now, their technique was very interesting, and this is what is much discussed in the book, and this is why it is intriguing to have today a Jesuit Pope. Uh, let me explain why. Because... Uh, their technique was to, they quickly realized that, of course, what, what was going on wasn't just the, the Catholics trying to get the Protestants back. Uh, many countries in Europe had converted to Protestantism, Germany, Holland, uh, most of the Scandinavian countries, England, of course. And the game became literally global because... What happened, more or less, at the same time was the discovery of the New World by Columbus. And so suddenly there was all these new people all over the world that could be converted. And there was a kind of rush 
on the one hand by the Protestants who managed to convert most of the Americas, North America, into Protestantism, mainly because of the, the, the British uh, occupation. And on the other hand, the, uh, the, uh, the missionaries, the, the, the Jesuits, uh, in South America, in, in uh, Asia, in Africa. So this was the game. And uh, it, it, it's quite amazing to, knowing this, that suddenly, out of 2,000 years of papacy, there is now, at the seat of St. Peter, one of these Jesuits, Cardinals, who is at the head, literally at the head of Christendom, or, or well, of Catholic Christendom. And uh, he probably, in my view, was chosen precisely because of this, because uh, the church is in desperate need for some very positive propaganda. It has lost many of its uh, followers. Uh, you know of all the scandals, pedophilia, and all these uh, issues. Mm. And uh, this man, uh, although um, I'm sure a very um, compassionate and, uh, and uh, uh, wants to help the poor and all this business, but he is no, uh, is no choir boy. I mean, he knows very well. He's a marketing man. I mean, he's a super marketing man because, and he's done extraordinarily well in a matter of weeks. I mean, it's amazing. Yeah, it just feels, it feels to me like the church is going through this rebranding kind of phase, uh, you know, internationally, trying to convert people back to it, get people back to it and change the image and, and do damage control. Um, do you think that he's going to do that or do you think that this is just kind of an attempt well, to cover up the other self. Well, don't expect too much from a, uh, a reformation. And the whole point of the Catholic Church is that it sits on very, very stringent dogmas and doctrines that no pope is going to change. Uh, this is something that everybody has to understand, that the Catholic Church has, in a sense, its own constitution. Uh, or rather the, the Nicene Creed that was, uh, that was signed and sealed, uh, a bit like the founding fathers of America by a group of cardinals, uh, in the fourth century. Hello? Oh yeah, can you hear yeah. me still? Yeah, we're here. Yeah. And, uh, this is known as Nicene Creed. It was, it was, uh, signed by 200 bishops plus, uh, in Nicaea, in Turkey. And that's it. That's, that's the constitution. And you know how difficult it is to change a constitution. <laughs> uh, it might have a few addendums. It's had a few throughout uh, Christian history, but very mild. No, what this Pope is going to do is he's going to change the image of the church. And, uh, and here we come to the, to the choice of name. Uh, because, because frankly, the name has, the name is dualistic. On the one hand, because he's a Jesuit, uh, many people uh, are, are wondering if he really meant when he said my name is Francis, if he really meant Francis Javier, the, the co-founder of uh, the Jesuit movement. Now, uh, and of course, there is Francis of Assisi who founded the Franciscan movement. Now, it is a very, very clever symbolism because Francis of Assisi, certainly in Catholicism and certainly in Italy, is the most popular saint you can imagine, and he, uh, in the 13th century, uh, managed to bring back an enormous amount of people into the Catholic fold, uh, mainly the poor. Uh, Francis of Assisi proposed literally a new approach, which was more or less what this new pope is doing. He he, the new approach was... He was shocked, too, by the opulence of the church and the opulence of the Vatican, and uh, he formed an order known as the Shulas. They used to go barefoot and, and work with their hands, and uh, the people loved them. And uh, he was very genuine. Uh, Francis is one of my heroes of history. So this new pope um, is sending the message uh, that he wants to go back to the, to the root of, uh, of, of Christianity, which is apostolic. Apostolic means these very first apostles, if you like, that went wandering around, uh, like the twelve apostles of, of, of Christ, uh, 
uh, without all the the, the, the trappings of of, uh, of the church and uh, got people into the fold. So mm. it's the it's it's his approach, and he's done exceedingly well. I mean, I was saying earlier that my friends in Rome are saying this is amazing. I mean. Suddenly, there is a kind of surge in in interest in in the church. Uh, people are rushing to see him walk in the street, and he's shaking hands and kissing babies and all this business. <laughs> he, he is <laughs> well, doing I, very I well. Can I understand. Mean, he, yeah, the, the enthusiasm is wonderful. Um, but see, what I question is: Will people be able to get over the scandals that have crippled the church, uh, specifically the abuses to children, and uh, along those lines? I mean, so much of that has come out and become public. How do you think he's going to handle or how people should uh, view this, this pedophilia kind of string that goes through the Catholic Church that has become so public over the years? Yeah, you know, uh, I, I want to tell you what a, a very senior Freemason told me once, and he was absolutely right. I mean, uh, the fact that sometimes you, there are Freemasons who are caught red-handed in, in, uh, in uh, conspiracy deals or in, uh, in corruption doesn't mean that they're all that way. And, uh, but it does attract attention. But let's face it, pedophilia occurs much more outside uh, the priesthood than it does in the priesthood. But, of course, we don't want to see priests uh, doing that sort of thing. Uh, but... I think his approach will be to do a great mea culpa, and that's what he proposed. He's, they're going to say sorry and, uh, and start new. I mean, he wants to clean the slate. And he's made it known. I mean, he's made it known to the cardinals that this is what he expects the church, literally the whole body of the church, to do, is to apologize, to, to admit to its faults, and uh, and that's it, not to do again. He's he's very clever, I have to say he is, because you know me, uh, Hillary, I, I, I've been a great student of symbolism and that kind of uh, approach, which uh, I suppose you could call marketing, but... Um, <laughs> I wouldn't call it marketing. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but, but this, yeah. is, this, is, this is propaganda at the highest of level. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting that he's an evil propaganda uh, conspirator, but he, they are using propaganda. I mean, one of the big tools of the church is propaganda, and, and, and they won't deny that. But one of the big acts, uh, you have to understand that there are certain things that these very big um, uh, preachers, these rabbis, if you like, uh, these uh, magicians, uh, call them what you like. I mean, Christ uh, Jesus must have been one of those. And uh, one of the scenes that comes to mind as we were talking now, this business about uh, saying I'm sorry, is the scene, uh, you're going to like this, the scene of, of the Testament where Maria Magdalena, uh, who is regarded as a terrible sinner and she has committed all sorts of adulterous acts, and the crowds, the, the Jewish uh, crowd that wants to punish her according to God's law. They, they, they want to stone her to death. And they chase her in the street, and she falls at the feet of this magician, this, this propaganda guy, like this, this very first pope, if you want. And he does something quite extraordinary. I mean, he's confronted with a bunch of very aggressive determined people who believe that they're going to do God's law and they're very, very, very angry with this woman. And they're holding stones and they, they want to stone her to death. And what he does, he does two things. He, he, he tells the crowds, uh, you know the famous words, who has not committed a sin, cast the first stone. And uh, he's not just saying those words. He, God, he must have looked at them in such a way that he literally humbled them. But what he's doing, a lot of people don't realize what he's doing. He's actually changing what these people believe to be God's law. He is reforming the Hebraic, the Judaic religion there and then. This is quite extraordinary. But what he does with a woman is his famous words. He says, stand up, say you're sorry, and start all over again. And this is what this man wants to do. And if he's, he's going to do it, he's very, very, he's very good at this. And in fact, that's what is needed. What the, what, I mean, if one wants to have Catholicism, uh, I'm not so sure if it's such a good thing, but 
if it's going to survive, it's going to need that act, that, that amazing act where he does this with Mother Church, if you like. He will say, stand up, say you're sorry, and start afresh. So you know, it's like he's, healing, he's got, a, healing a rift, healing the rift, really, isn't it? Yes, but uh, yes, you're absolutely right, Hillary. But it's very, something very difficult to convey to, especially on on, a, on the radio this way. Uh, but the acts, literally the acts of such a well natural magician, is I see Jesus as a magician. Uh, I don't mean it in the negative sense. Uh, my book, by the way, talks a lot about magic because this was what was happening within the church in the, in the 16th century, but this is another topic. Uh, the act and the way it's done and the choice of context and the choice of symbolism, the gesture, the, the, the way the words are pronounced have a tremendous effect. And what people have to realize is that the Pope is no more a, a man, if you like. He is a symbol. He is a walking, living, breathing symbol. And what a symbol he is. Every move he makes, every gesture he takes, everything he says, everything he does, is going to act as a sign, a powerful symbol. And he knows this. He knows this very, very well. Believe me, he knows this because he is a well-trained Jesuit uh, of that order, they, 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 that's the whole purpose of, uh, of, the, of the Jesuit orders to train people who know this. And he's now literally at the very head. He's at the top of the pyramid, and he's watched. And he does, and he says, so far, what has very much pleased those who hardly two weeks ago were very, very uh, angry and upset, and, uh, and and even thinking of getting out of Christian Christianity. So he is, he's the man. He is the man. <laughs> he's the man. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I have to oh, ask no, no, you I, 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 oh, I love this man. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm, just, I'm curious, you know, um, what, now I know this might be getting off topic slightly here, shifting into a different direction, but, you know, this change, this patriarchal, uh, you know, <sighs> legacy. <laughs> Where where does the feminine energy come into? Where does the goddess of energy, you know, the the, the energy of the goddess come into this? Ooh, I mean, we're talking well, about well, well, well. Well, hold on, hold on. I mean, we're talking about <laughs> healing this rift, you know, and I think people uh, overall are ready for the balancing of that energy, or at least a, a, a better representation of that energy within the church. Do you suppose he will he will bridge that somehow? He's ready. He's already doing it, uh, Hillary. He, he's doing it big time. Uh, first of all, uh, the patron saint of the Jesuits, although it's, it's, it's a totally men-only club, if you like, like all the priesthood, is, uh, is the goddess. Or let's put it this way, the Virgin Mary. Uh, I'll, I'll send you the logos of the uh, Collegio Romano. Uh, he did his great, great first symbolic act by giving his first papal mass at the church of Santa Maria Maggiore, the, the, the most uh, prominent church of the Madonna. He is, he is a follower of the Madonna, and so are most Argentinians, by the way. So he, he, is, he is very, very, very conscious about the feminine aspect of this religion. Uh, you've got to realize that the Christian religion, uh, from, from a historian point of view, and coming back to my book now, The Vatican Mystery, is that to me it's nothing more or nothing less than the metamorphosis of the pagan religions, particularly the Isaac, the, the religion of Isis. Uh, to historians it's very, very obvious. Uh, the, the whole machinery of ancient Egypt, uh, when it was occupied by Rome, uh, was used literally to create this new religion. Uh, I'll go in, into it in a minute. But so the main uh, the, the main uh, character, the main uh, the main deity of this religion, uh, coming from ancient Egypt, is the goddess, or more precisely. The, the celestial goddess, 
Uh, and uh, there is no doubt in my mind that the virgin, or at least the virgin of the Roman Catholic Church, is none other than a metamorphosis of, uh, of the goddess Isis. Uh, indeed, many of the church fathers uh, quite acknowledge this. Uh, but then again, I don't want to go into too much detail because <laughs> it's, it's all in the book. But You know, and um, I'm being very quiet, so you just keep going and keep telling so, us a little more. <laughs> so you feel that she's so are, um, well represented? There's no doubt. No, there's no doubt. Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, don't misunderstand the Roman Catholic Church in that it is a patriarchal religion as such. It comes from Judaism, it comes from the Old Testament, which is intensely patriarchal, that's, that's no doubt. But the Roman Catholic Church um, is intensely um, dualistic and particularly uh, focused on the, uh, on the Virgin Mary. I mean, uh, all you have to do is come to Spain, <laughs> Hillary, and uh, they, don't, they don't pray to God, they don't pray to Jesus, they pray to the Virgin Mary. I mean, the Virgin Mary is the big thing here. And, uh, I mean, <laughs> half the population of Spain is called Maria, for a start. <laughs> um, so, you've got to see this, and uh, although it's given itself a bad name because of what the priests have been doing, uh, if I'm going to choose, but I'm not religious in that sense, I mean, I'm an historian, I, uh, I believe in my own, uh, my own way of looking at the universe, but if I was going to choose a religion, uh, I would choose Catholicism, uh, not because I was born one, but because it does have that aspect. I mean, what really has happened is that the names have changed, that's all. I mean, we have uh, the Virgin Mary, who is so Isaiah that it's unbelievable that people don't see it, so obviously. You will see in this book, by the way. That, and there's been many books. I mean, I'm not the only one who's, uh, who's written about this, but in this particular book, uh, coming back to that topic, uh, I, even myself, who had studied this on, on many, many uh, occasions with Graham Hancock, as you know, uh, when we wrote Talisman and, and, and the Master Game, we, we, we looked into all this. But in this particular book, uh, I'm going very, very much behind the scene and bring it to the surface. Bring it to the surface. So it, uh, my whole approach is to bring all this out and make it very visible to everybody. I, mean, I literally mean visible. And one of the things about this book, like my very first book, uh, my very first book, as you know, was the Orion Correlation, the Orion Mystery, which, which presented the, the correlation between the stars and the pyramids of Giza, stars of Orion. You know that, oh, really, no. don't you? Yes, I know. Very well. Say yes. Say yes. <laughs> it is kind of rude for the host to interrupt the guest, you know, so I don't I'm, say I'm Egyptian. You can, I'm from <laughs> Egypt. You can interrupt me all the time. <laughs> and everybody who knows how, how often you come on the show knows that I just, I love the sound of your voice. I love what you have to say, and so I love to listen. Um, I do have a question. The City of the Sun um, is uh, part of the title of your book. For those listening, what is that? Well, uh, the city of the sun. Well, let me put it this way. This book opens up, literally opens up, like a court case. It says, uh, here is the Piazza St. Peter. Now, the Piazza St. Peter is this great, well, everybody's seen it on television lately. It's this great elliptical giant square. They call it a square, but it's in fact an ellipse. Uh, with the obelisk right in the middle, and uh, you saw it lately on television, where all these um, hundreds of thousands of people gather uh, to see the Pope at the Basilica. Basilica, the, the church, coming out of his balcony. So the piazza is this, this square. And the, the, book, the book literally opens with, like a court case. I, I imagine a jury sitting on, on the side, and I imagine one um, prosecution saying, this piazza, as amazing as it sounds, is designed using Kepler, Johann Kepler, the famous astronomer, using Kepler's first law of planetary motion. And when you look at Kepler's diagram, very famous Kepler's diagram, it's precisely that. So it looks like it, but... The question is, is it meant to be the same? 
And the defense, on the other hand, says, no, 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 it's nothing to do with that. It represents the, the open arms of the church, of Mother Church, uh, welcoming all the uh, people in the square. So there you are, you have two totally opposing uh, views, the prosecution and the defense. And the question is, okay, we present the case. And to present this case, I've had to spend uh, several years uh, in detail, six months of writing this book, uh, going to Rome something like 20 times over the last two years. And the story, amazingly, starts in Egypt and ends, I'll give you the precise date, it ends in 1656, when the architect uh, Bernini, and your, your listeners would know of him, he's, uh, he's the big hero in Angels and Demons, the, the architect Bernini, the papal architect, the great Baroque architect Bernini, is commissioned by the Pope, at the time Pope Alexander VII, and around them is a group of people, I will talk about this in a minute, and he's commissioned to design the piazza. So the, the book starts in ancient Alexandria, hops very quickly to the Renaissance, 200 years of uh, events leading to that moment. And I just want to I just want to interrupt for one second and remind uh, or to let listeners know that there is a wonderful article on Robert's uh, website. The link is on the archive page of my uh, homepage here on Achieve Radio. It's called Under the Pope's Nose. If you Google that and Robert Bavall, you will come up with it. It's a wonderful uh, oversight of what he's talking about at this point here, too. So I just wanted to let people know they could bring that up while they're listening uh, to read after the show. Please continue. Well, uh, fine. I'm, I'm <laughs> grateful you did this. <laughs> Because, because, yeah, no, no, it's very good because they can actually see uh, what I'm saying. It's there in images. Anyway, the, the point is this, that uh, having presented the case in great detail, hello? <laughs> Sorry about this, it's going That's silent. okay, yeah, we can hear you fine. The, the line is okay on this side, yep. Yeah, okay, having presented the case, uh, as I've just described, then the reader is sitting there like the jury... And I quite assure you, it's very much like uh, my first book. You know, when I, when I said three pyramids look like the three stars of Orion's belt, well, at first a lot of people were saying, well, yeah, but it could be a coincidence and all that. But when you present a case, when you look at all the evidence, when you look at all the people involved, and this, unlike the, the, the story of the pyramids, uh, it's much more recent history. So we have letters, we have documents, we have the characters, and believe me, they're wonderful characters. I mean, I actually fell in love with Christina <laughs> right, uh, writing this book, because I really have to tell you about her in a minute, because you're going to like this. Anyway, so the point is this. You present the case, and there you're looking at the piazza again, and uh, I, according to me, you're going to have at least 10 people of the jury, if not the 12 of them, saying, no, it's not a coincidence. Now, what does it mean? What does it mean? I mean, uh, well, first of all, it means something quite extraordinary because this particular uh, theory, this, this heliocentric theory, which began with Copernicus and modified by Kepler, was considered the most vile heresy at the time. It was, you, you, you would literally get burned if you were even to speak about it. So... It's quite amazing that it is there under the Pope's nose, literally, as I, I say in the article. So the big question is, uh, well, how the hell did it get done, and who was involved? And, 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 but finally, what is it for? I mean, yeah, okay, it doesn't look like a coincidence, but what for? And this is the most exciting thing about this book, is that in order to understand what for, the book very carefully, I'm cooking it very slowly now, because what the reader has to understand is what I, be, I call now, and, and many other authors who have been involved with this are beginning to call talismanic magic. You remember we had this long talk once on, on one of your shows? I do, yes, yes. And that is the difficult one, because people have to understand this and then realize a bit, very, well, I'll bring it as an analogy, very much like I, when I wrote my first book and I showed and it was shown on television, and they keep showing it, by the way, on History Channel, on Ancient Aliens, <laughs> there's this correlation. 
And uh, the funny thing is that there it was for 5,000, maybe more uh, years, nobody had seen it. It was there, nobody saw it. And then I say, oh, well, look at three stars, three pyramids, uh, and here is uh, the reason why it doesn't look like a coincidence. And suddenly, I've activated this, this, this talisman. Suddenly the pyramids have a different meaning altogether. And every time people look at these pyramids, every time people look at the stars, they are affected by this talisman. It's, it's become alive. I'll give you a very good metaphor in simple terms. It's like bringing a, a child at Christmas time in a darkened room, and he's there, and suddenly you plug in and you light up the Christmas tree. And there it is. It's lit up. It's, it's, it's visible. We can see it. It has a tremendous effect on the child. And this is the same thing with the talisman. Uh, I've lit up literally the, the pyramids. They, 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 begin, they begin to shine, if you like, like stars in the mind of people who see them. Same thing with this piazza. Believe it or not, it's going to sort of do the same thing as the three stars and the three pyramids. It's going to become alive. And people will see it for what it is and what it means... And that's it. It will never be seen again as a simple architectural um, square. So and do that you feel that that can, be, that can be applied to any significant monument in the world if it's yeah, lit up yeah. the right way? Yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, as you know, I've written a, a book, a 600-page book with, uh, with Hancock in 2004, which which proposes precisely that, is that we looked at various cities like, uh, well, Rome, although we briefly touched Rome, but Paris, uh, uh, London, uh, Washington, Washington in particular, where there is this city and city plans with monuments uh, in very strategic places, and suddenly they become alive when somebody points out and says... Uh, uh, hey, look, uh, this, this monument is aligned with, uh, with this, this, uh, this other one, and uh, it, 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 it looks at the sunrise at this particular day, and so forth. Because that's what almost certainly these architects had in mind, and these town planners had in mind. Uh, well, we know with Washington, D.C. that there was a strong uh, Masonic influence. What do you say to the people that suggest that the alignments, the Masonic involvement has to do with more of a negative connotation than uh, a more positive one? Well, like, uh, like Catholicism, it depends on which side of the fence you're on. But uh, there's a big hissing noise. Are you, you getting that? Uh, no, I don't hear it. Um, oh. I hear you clear. Yeah. It stopped. No, I think it was your, your friend Bill. <laughs> Okay. Uh, Bill's my producer, everybody. <laughs> Hi, Bill. How are you? You're very quiet. I hope you're enjoying this. Uh, all right. Well, uh, let, you, you, you've asked the last question because there's a kind of very negative tag, uh, almost diabolical tag that is placed on these kind of uh, schemes. Uh, and uh, I don't think it's right at all. <laughs> The intention, well, first of all, bear in mind what I said earlier on, is that uh, when these things were being done, I'm talking more now of the Vatican design and uh, the 16th century, 17th century, when these things were done, not just in Rome, by the way, in Paris, in London, it was part of a big propaganda activity uh, related to the Reformation, and the Counter-Reformation. In other words, that the Protestants were doing such things in order to create these giant, powerful messages, talismans, monumental architecture, to draw back people into, or, or rather pull people from Catholicism into uh, Protestantism. And the other way around, from the Catholic point of view. So you got cities like Paris, which was in, at the time intensely, and still is intensely Catholic, doing this kind of games. Uh, now, later on, one of the big players that came into that fold were the Freemasons. The Freemasons was even more clever, and they employed ancient symbolism, like the others did, but much, much more uh, uh, effectively, in order to do the very same thing. And this is precisely what Washington, D.C. is. It is 
a giant, I call it a giant city talisman. It is a giant temple, if you like, a Masonic temple, that people who not only live in there, but people who are aware of it or come to visit it, are imbued by the, uh, by the whole mood of this place, once they realize what it is. And the whole idea, the positive idea, is to make you think of what it represents, not simply because there are alignments. It makes you think of the tenets, makes you think of the constitution, if you like, of the Freemasons, which ultimately is nothing diabolical. It, it presents, and believe me, I'm not a Freemason, so I'm, I'm not uh, advertising on their behalf. But it, it, it promotes the virtues of what they believe to be the important tenets of Western civilization. You know, brotherhood, uh, freedom, uh, equality, uh, all these things. And even though they are extremely patriarchal, like the church, don't get them wrong. They, they, they have very, very powerful virtues that incorporate both sexes. So, it is not diabolical. Yeah, I know there is a lot of conspiracy theories and they want to rule the world and the new world order. No, no, sure, they, they do have a vision of a world order. There's no doubt about it. So does the church. Uh, but the idea is not to, to control the, the minds of people and to uh, control the finances and so forth, although this is part of the mechanism. The idea is to inso- install virtues. Uh, so I- from that point of view, I don't see it as a bad thing at all. And the same thing with Catholicism. I mean, they're not uh, advertising pedophilia and all this business. Their virtues are very good. The problem in, with all these power structures is that, well, we know power can corrupt, and there are, unfortunately, hiccups in all the processes. I'm a very positively minded person, as you know, Hillary. <laughs> so, I, I, I look at a good thing in, in, in what appears to be a bad thing. I mean, I, I cannot conceive of a world without virtues. Now, whether they come from religious orders, uh, religion is nothing more than, than a, a constitution I mean, uh, with belief systems, or whether they come from Freemasonry, or whether they come from our own government, but our government has lost track. They're more concerned with with, with, uh, with budgets, they're more concerned with, uh, with inflation, they look at what's happening in Cyprus, uh, they're more concerned with, uh, with bank loans and all this business, and they're forgetting the most essential thing that holds a culture together in the right track, which I call the virtues. We've got, these have to be not only installed, but they have to be ingrained in the people. And then you have something good. Uh, this, is, this is my great belief. I mean, uh, I'm going to be an old man now. <laughs> I'm nearly 60. Uh, well, I'm in my 66th year, in case you... <laughs> You listen to this, but I'm still going strong like Scotch yeah. whiskey, you know. And, well, um, like, you know, um, I, I'm curious, and I, I know we only have a few minutes left in the show. But what I'd like to ask you is how this book has changed you personally. Abs- what well, this book has been a great adventure to me. I mean, I, it's very. I enjoy my books. I enjoy writing my books, but this one has got me as the writer. Thrilled. I mean, I, I'm, I'm actually don't want to let it go. <laughs> you know, I'm keep keep editing and editing because I'm enjoying the, the 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 whole theme of it. It's it's an it's an amazing detective sleuthing in in the highest possible of manner. I mean, I'm, I'm you, I hope I'm you'll enjoy it as much as I did because it takes you on a on an amazing mystery magical tour of the most important time in our civilization with characters, like I said, with Galileo and popes and the Renaissance philosophers, wonderful magicians like uh, Ficino, Marsilio, the the Cosimo di Medici, uh, uh, Queen Christina, which I didn't have a chance to talk about. (laughs) Uh, Queen Christina, by the way, very quickly, uh, is and will be, many things have been done about her, by the way, we all forgot, I mean... um, the famous film by, uh, what's her name? Oh, my God, the German famous actress. Come on. Uh, Marlene Dietrich, who uh, played the role. But Queen Christina was the, was the daughter of 
the king of Sweden. The king of Sweden, a Protestant country, was the deadliest enemy of the Pope. He formed the most powerful army in Europe during the Thirty Year War, during this Reformation, Counter Reformation battle, and brought the papacy to its knees. But then unfortunately he dies in battle and she becomes queen at the age of six. I mean, it's quite amazing. But at the age of 24, she has a nervous breakdown, by the way, and at the age of 24, stuns everybody because she says, I'm going to convert back to Catholicism, which in those days, even now, but it's like the Queen of England saying, I'm becoming a Catholic, you know. And <laughs> she sends an incredible message and the Pope, the Pope invites her to Rome, and she settles in Rome, and she becomes virtually the queen of Rome. She's an extraordinary character. She's like Cleopatra. She's a virgin, by the way. She, she lived her life as a virgin. She refused to marry. She was a great erudite. She, she, she could speak eight languages, nine languages, Hebrew and, and Arabic and Swedish and French. She spoke French better than the French, they say. And she studied the hermetic tradition, she studied all the classics, she studied alchemy, Kabbalah, you name it. She was quite a lady. And she is there. She is there when Bernini is given the commission to design, and she is his best friend. They are buddy buddies. So she is the key to this, this whole mystery. She, she brings with her an amazing vision. And believe it or not, it sounds crazy, but believe it or not, she is convinced that she is the reincarnated Isis. And that's the, the, the amazing story that comes out of this book. It's true. It, it sounds crazy, but it's true. And she behaves well, I like can't that. wait to read it. I, and I, you have me sitting on the edge of my seat, very excited to get my copy. And I hope everybody listening to the show is feeling the same way. It's uh, the Vatican Mystery. It's going to be released this fall, 2013. And uh, Robert, you know, I can't tell you, we could probably sit here for another hour and uh, it just keep going and going. It's always such a pleasure to have you here. And uh, I know my listeners greatly enjoy you when you come to visit. So I just want to say thank you very much for being here. It's been an absolute pleasure absolute joy to listen to you and uh, you just have lit me up literally and i just can't wait to get on <laughs> well, thank, Start in thank you Hillary. <laughs> thank you thank you very much it's it's always a pleasure and thank you for giving me the floor because you're you're very good at this and you know me i i, I but let me let you into a little secret for the next interview somewhere on the left side of my chest there is a red button and if you press it i stop <laughs> okay I will remember that. I will remember that. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for being here. Pleasure, pleasure. Thank you.